Can you please bring in our next speaker? Who the hell are you? Oh, I'm going to agree as the day is. I'll be serving as counsel in the future. You see, you've got nothing to worry about. You're Hello and welcome to the Makeflix virtual launch party to celebrate this movie right here, Brimstone Incorporated. Over the next hour, actually, I should introduce myself first. My name is Heath. You may, some of you may know me from Serial at Midnight website, YouTube channel, uh, and I'm really excited because over the next hour, we are going to talk to the the man behind Brimstone. We're also going to talk about this movie right here, and well. Over 30 years of filmmaking experience, starting in 1989 with The Dead Next Door, James L. Edwards has been an actor, a writer, a producer, now a director. Let's get the man out here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James L. Edwards. 
Hey, man, this is exciting. I'm so excited to be talking to you. We're live. Uh, it's 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 awesome. We're we're gonna talk about brimstone. We're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about brimstone. We're gonna talk about your directorial debut. What we're gonna talk about, man, thirty plus years on screen. First of all, I'm old. What is yeah. That, what does that feel like? I mean, you started this when you were like a, legitimately like a kid, right? Yeah, I was uh, I was 12 years old when I uh, first got involved with uh, J.R. Bookwalter, and at the time it was Amsco Studios, which later became Tempe and then Makeflex. Um, yeah, it's it's I, I had a very interesting childhood. That's that's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> you grew up on screen. I mean, and it's it's you talking your the commentary for for Brimstone Incorporated about how I mean now it's like a family affair. You've got your your kids are in your movies and stuff it's pretty awesome yeah it's it's one of those things too where uh, i have three kids two one of them absolutely loves being in front of the camera one of them does it begrudgingly and one of them will not appear in any way shape or form so so, so it's like but but yeah i'm trying to get them involved as much as possible so tell us a little bit about the movie tell us about brimstone incorporated um, Brimstone Incorporated came about uh, initially because we were, um, my director of photography, Gordon Cameron, um, had some leads as far as possible investors for future projects. And when he approached me about it, he's like, look, I, I have these leads. The problem is they're, um, it, it's older money. So A, they're not going to sit there and watch your two hour movie. And B, by the, uh, referring to my first film, her name was Krista. And two, the, uh, once they get to the ending, they're going to be upset. They're, they're really not going to be thrilled with what you've shot. Yeah. So his idea was, why don't we make a couple of short films as presentations to, um, uh, to basically see if we can get investors. And I was initially against that because I don't really know. For one, anybody who's seen or has seen anything that I've written knows I get very wordy. I'm very dialogue heavy. So the idea of doing like a 20 minute short seemed to me like impossible, yeah. but doing an anthology on the other hand, it's like, well, that might be fun. That, and I was really desperate to do after being so emotionally invested in Krista, as far as writing this dramatic piece that I really uh, like was a passion project. I just wanted to do a fun horror film, just something that, that, that would hopefully be a little emotionally easier to do than Krista. And when I soon found out getting into it, it actually was harder than doing Krista. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good point because her name was Krista is, I mean, it's, it's intense. It's really, um, it's emotional. I mean, I got goosebumps multiple times through that movie because see, I wanted to, I wanted to save this for later into the, the conversation, but let's just go like, her name, her name is Krista, is your directorial debut. Mm -hmm. Wrote it, you directed it, you star in it. You take it's this physical transformation that you make in this movie. I mean, you go like De Niro in this thing. <laughs> and um, it is, I mean, I, I don't even, I don't want to spoil it for anybody that hasn't seen it because there is a journey there. But I will say like, it, it's about, oh, you tell me if I'm going too far. But if it, like, it's, what is more horrific, right? Than finding what you've been missing for so long and then having it taken away from you that's right that's her. can you talk, you talk talk to me a little bit about that like where did that come from that basically was a product of um i um when i um when i turned 40 it was probably honestly and not to sound too deep but it was a real very emotional time for me in the sense that i i was 40 years old i was going through my second divorce i was unemployed I had, during my separation of my ex-wife, I had to move back in with my parents, with my three kids. And it was just like, I remember my 40th birthday waking up and looking in the mirror, not recognizing the guy that was in the mirror and going, is this it? Is this how this ends? You know? So my, my thought process with directing or writing initially, Krista, because I didn't originally have plans to direct it. Uh, my thought process was, I wanted to do a movie that basically took that idea and took it to the worst possible case scenario. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, I mean, hopefully I did that. <laughs> so. You did. And it's, I mean, it's, it's as dark as dark can get, 
but it's it's not i don't feel like it's exploitative i feel like it's really rooted in something that i think all of us can relate to and because it's it, it's personal like you've explained your connection with it uh i think it's got something really special in it so it's the connection or the journey i guess from there to brimstone incorporated is really interesting to me because they're two completely different uh approaches and tones uh brimstone incorporated being fun i mean like it's i laughed out loud multiple times in the movie um so i don't know was there how, talk a little bit about you come from this deeply personal thing and then you make this man I know it was a challenging production because you talked a little bit about that you can tell us more about that but i'm just curious how you switch those gears and uh what that felt like as a creator as a you know you you write this stuff you put it on the screen how do you how do you make that switch the, the, for me, the most challenging thing about filmmaking in general is not being pigeonholed as one type of actor or one type of writer or one type of director. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of my fellow filmmakers kind of get stuck in this thing where it's like, I, I really enjoy this kind of film, so that's the only kind of film I want to make. And where if that makes them happy, that's great. I didn't want that for me. I, I really wanted to show that I could juggle multiple genres, multiple situations. I'm always going to have a true love for horror, but there are a million different types of horror that, that can be. And I just didn't want to be the, I didn't want to be known as the necrophilia guy or the, the, uh, I mean, I'm always going to be known as the heavy dialogue guy, but the, the guy, the, the uh, there's a, there's a million factors in that. Yeah. So for me, the trick was I wanted to make sure to do after Krista, I wanted to make sure to do something that was as far away from removed from that type of film as possible. That way it was going to completely throw the audience like a curveball. Mm -hmm. That, and to be perfectly honest with you, I'm still, as a director, I'm still learning. I, I, I know now that where Krista I'm incredibly proud of, it was a lot to ask the audience to basically except a hybrid of two different genres that don't really belong together. One being a, a romantic drama and the other one being a, uh, a, a necrophilia film. So that being said, I wanted something a little more audience friendly. Yeah. Um, again, we've got great, we've gotten great response from both, but I'd be lying if I didn't recognize the fact that it's like a lot of people it's one of those movies where the romantic drama audience isn't going to dig it because of the ending and the horror audience, some of them will be very upset because they're waiting quite a bit for what they feel the, the horror element should be. So yeah. I was trying to balance that. They still make a movie that I could emotionally get behind. What has the audience feedback been? I mean, you make this very personal, very emotional movie and then, you know, now we have an anthology, a horror anthology. What is the what is the feedback been for both of these? Have you had any sort of like, well, I like this, but I don't know about this, or did you see a lot of support for both? It's it's always tricky because I tend not to take, especially now, and in, in I always as an actor and a writer, I always kind of pr uh, prided myself on the fact that I didn't care what anybody thought. I just was doing what I enjoyed. You know, that all went out the window when I made Krista because. I, uh, it was very personal, so therefore every single review that came in, good, bad, or indifferent, I immediately took to heart. And that's typically not like me, and it won't be like me ever again, because to be quite frank with you, a lot of that emotional response, I'm the type of guy that when I get in that mindset, we could have 75% fantastic reviews and I'll concentrate on that 25% that didn't like the movie. And no matter what you do, you're never going to have everyone like your movie. I don't care what movie you've made. So it really reached a point for me where, uh, what was it, last April, because uh, shortly after we released Krista, because of the amount of stress that I had put on myself to be successful with it and find its audience and... Uh, basically read into every single thing that was written about it. I ended up, uh, I ended up having a stroke. I ended up going into the hospital because I, uh, what was it? And ended up having multiple strokes because of it. So now I tend to be a little more relaxed with that, where it's like, you know what, no matter what, it's one person's opinion. And a lot of the problem too was back in the nineties, I was a film critic for, um, uh, Alternative Cinema Magazine, which was JR's magazine to promote a lot of indie products. 
And the problem was I kind of fashioned myself into this shock jock Howard Stern type critic where I would just destroy people's movies. Yeah. Those people remember that <laughs> with good reason. I don't blame them for remembering yeah. that. Well, a lot of those people have held a grudge for that long. And again, I don't looking back on it, I don't blame them one bit. I everyone has their share of people that want you to fail. Yeah. So, but luckily I've, I've been able to find a happy balance in as far as just accepting, hey, you know what? No movie's perfect and people are going to be critical versus, hey, this person genuinely wants you dead. So, so you just got to go from there. I have to ask, are you okay? Have you recovered from, from the... Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good, actually. It was, um, it was a wake-up call because uh, it was, like I said, it, I mean, I'll, I'll say it's a semi-wake-up call because it was one of those where... Between stress, between overdoing things, between the fact that I was smoking four packs a day, it didn't help. Let's put all of that kind of kind of eventually came back. Now I've cut down on my stress, and a lot of it too. To be perfectly frank with you, you had mentioned before about my uh, transformation, my physical transformation for the role of Stephen, and her name was Krista. I ended up for that role uh, putting on forty pounds shaving my head to make it look like I had uh, male pattern baldness and growing mm -hmm. this great uh, pedophile mustache. Um, so it was like, but once we were done shooting, I wanted to drop that weight as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. And I was already a diabetic at the time. And I just decided, well, you know, the, uh, very foolishly, I decided the best way to handle this, I'm going to stop all my medication. So I literally dropped like 35 pounds within two months. The problem is that was a factor in putting me in the hospital. But no, I feel great now. No, no problems. Okay. Uh, wow. That's a lot. It's, you've always been so, I don't know, so authentic. And even the way you're talking about stuff, I mean, there's just no airs. There's no pretense or anything like that. And I admire that. And I wanted to, since we are here to talk about uh, these discs, which are available right now at makeflix.com. And this is a, uh, I'm reversed, so I'm like, which, which, this, this is currently still under a 30 day exclusive. Um, That's right. Movie. And they make great Mother's Day gifts too. So, <laughs> moms love anthology horror. Um, they do. And they love necrophilia love stories. So, I mean, they do. definitely. And that's the thing about that movie is that it, it plays, I mean, you can't put it in any, like, you can't put it in a box. It's, it's, it's a remarkable thing. But, the commentaries. I want to talk about the special features and the commentaries because I think what we're yeah. seeing right now is uh, just a man who's like, no, here it is. I asked you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull the curtain back just a little bit. I asked you in a uh, like a message as Facebook. I was like, what was the reaction like? I mean, I asked the question here too, but I was like, what was your reaction like with, ver from her name was Krista versus Brimstone? And you were like, I was like, I don't want to ask you this when we're live. And you're like, no. No, no secrets. And I was like, okay, that's fine. We'll do it that way. <laughs> the amount of information that you put on commentary tracks and like the behind the scenes stuff. I mean, you've got like the fundraising video for her name is Krista that you've just put out there. Um, it's so, uh, I don't know, it's refreshing for one, but you know, I listen to a lot of audio commentaries and like not everybody can do it. And you just, I mean, you just talk and you've got, you're so honest about things, you know, you're like, well, I don't, like you're talking in the uh, the Brimstone Incorporated commentary, and you're like, well, you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. I, I'm still not super satisfied with how I, you know, it's a learning process. Like that vulnerability, people mm -hmm. need that. There are people who are watching this right now who may want to go create something themselves. And maybe it's important that they hear, well, it's not always a home run. It's a struggle. You have ups and downs. I just think that's valuable. Can you talk a little bit about being real and honest with your with your art? One of the things that always aggravated me about commentaries as someone who wanted to learn about filmmaking was, for better or worse, it was always candy-coated. Yeah. You very rarely heard the stories about self-doubt, about friction. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I there's a big difference between that and dirt. I don't want to get into dirt, typically. I, I never, whether I have a bad experience with an actor or a director or writer, I, I'd rather not go into those stories. I'll, I'll mention the story. I don't want to, I don't want to put the person on the spot, but that being said, I don't have a problem with saying, Hey, you know what? I screwed up here. This is, uh, this is something that I, I did and I should have done or this, that, and the other thing. And I think that's important because a lot, there are a lot of people doing this right now, many, many more people than were doing it back in the days when I was doing it with JR. Yeah. And on one hand, that's very refreshing, but on the other hand, 
it's also dangerous because now the market has been over flooded. And I would much rather have an outlet for everyone to kind of learn from their own mistakes and other people's. I, I, I'll give you an example. There are so many times where I talk to other filmmakers and they're terrified to tell me what their budget is. They're terrified to tell me how many days they shot. They're terrified. And it's like, I, I'm not asking this to judge you. I'm seeing what, what you were able to accomplish, you know? And again, it's a catch 22. You don't want to tell them that the movie costs too little because then they think it's a joke, but you don't want to tell them that it costs too big because it's like, well, why did you need that much money? So that's at least the way I've always looked at it. Yeah. No, it's, it's good. It's valuable because if you, if for those who want to learn, you have to be able to learn from honesty, from the truth. I mean, you can't learn from a smoke screen. So it's, it's great. I'm going to put you know, like Kevin Smith does great commentaries, Robert Rodriguez. I'm going to add you to that list because you do. Oh. great comments. Yeah, man. I'm in fantastic company then. Thank you so much. I'm honored. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about Cheyenne Day because mm -hmm. you pretty much discovered her, right? She wasn't acting before her name was Crystal, was she? She had mostly, I know she had done some brief acting in her late teens, early 20s. Mostly what she had done was um, uh, print work and modeling. And what had happened was we had our original run, our original between the Indiegogo, which failed miserably, by the way. It was a horrible, horrible experience. But between our Indiegogo and the fact that we just, just we were able to find the money to make the film, we had lost our original lead actress. She opted out of the film, and there were certain demands that I ex that we agreed on that uh, that later she opted not to do, and, and it's fine. But it put us in a situation where we needed to find an actress. So we did. We we put casting calls i oversaturated i went to every possible casting agency and ca uh, and casting website facebook and out of all of those we probably got i believe it was 73 actresses that were up for the role of krista some of which were complete newcomers some of them were people that i'd worked with in the past some of them were actresses that i had a, a tremendous amount of respect for and was shocked they were interested in being in my uh, directorial debut but nobody quite really fit the part. No, nobody, I mean, either it just wasn't working out. On a whim during all of this, I put a uh, an ad in the gigs section of our local Craigslist, and I got one response from it. And it was a young lady who had said, look, I'm interested in what you have to say, but it, if it has anything to do with porn or drugs, don't contact me. So I contact her. I'm like, no, it has. It's a completely legitimate project. There is nudity required, but it, it is legitimate. What do you say we meet in a public area and discuss it? Here's a, here's a couple of lines I want you, or here's a couple of scenes that I want you to memorize. Why don't we put you on film and see how it looks? So she shows up, and she was just absolutely amazing. And it was it was funny because it was one of those too good to be true moments where it's like. This is someone who has not acted, has not really acted before. Um, she's ten minutes, uh, ten minutes outside of my, uh, away from my own home. So she's local, and she's very passionate about the project, and is comfortable with nudity. Which a lot of it, it always cracks me up. Where it's like you can put in bold neon letters, "nudity required." And you'll have a, a dozen or so actresses contact us like, oh, I didn't realize there was nudity. It's like, well, then why are we both here? You know, I'm not trying to make a porn film, but at the same token, if it's important to the story, you kind of need that, you know. So, but no, she was phenomenal. Um, we've continued to work together. I actually just saw her last week to give her her copy of Brimstone, and she's very excited about the next one. And we're just kind of going from there. No, but I, I absolutely adore her. Yeah. And we get to see the the audition. I mean, it's included as an extra. Her the, her name was Crystal audition is it's, it's right here. Um, oh yeah, as well as uh, as well as some of our rehearsals as well. Because one of the things that was important to me was that, especially because Cheyenne had not really acted before, mm -hmm. I I knew she had a phenomenal uh, phenomenal audition, but I had also seen other situations where new actors or actresses a lot of times need a little more help than somebody who's familiar with it. So while we were prepping, I actually took a little extra time and we had a, a two or three month, I can't remember, a two or three month 
rehear uh, rehearsal process where we went through the entire script in sections and just re rehearsed uh, scenes until we were ready to go. And and some of that is featured on the disc as well. Yeah. And it's kind of like two two sides of Cheyenne Day because you get, uh, you know, she's it's, it, I'm having a hard time with this. I'm mirrored. Uh, you know, it's a very uh, earnest, serious kind of a role. And then in, in Brimstone, she just gets to choose scenery and, and go nuts, which is fun. That was one of the things that I'm very adamant about is, I, I mean, as you can tell with both Krista and Brimstone, I try and work with the same people. Mm -hmm. and that's very important to me. I like the idea of basically having a stable of actors that I know when I'm making a movie, they're going to be in it. Yeah. But that being said, I want to make sure that each film that they do, I try and mix it up for them as far as their characters go. The only person I haven't been able to do that yet with is Drew Fortier, which I'm working on it. I am, but he's just so good at that smarmy type of uh, lovable uh, asshole kind of role that it's like it's difficult to put him in something else because I I love watching him work. So yeah, you you talking about um, like the the regular players? I I I call you guys the Ohio Movie Mafia, which I don't know, mm -hmm. but that's what you guys are. So that's a good, a good like segue to talk about maybe some of the stuff in the past because you had a run yeah. there from the dead next door with with Jr. Mm -hmm. Our producer, he's in my ear right now. I have our producer Jr. Bookwalter, but uh, <laughs> you had a run for years. I mean, we're talking about you're in the dead next door. You got Robot Ninja. You uh, skinned alive. You are the Walkman victim, and you make mm -hmm. it's a fun. It's a fun. It's a fun kill scene. I really like that. It's just like, <laughs> but that, making that was that was my first stunt. It was my uh, that was my Jackie Chan days, and I got injured on that too. So did you really? <laughs> well, I had a nasty habit of being overzealous, so <laughs> I I think I was injured on every Tempe movie at some point. Nothing major, <laughs> but but always something where I'd look back on it and go, "Wow, that probably wasn't my wisest move." So you're in like. There's the so the Shaw on video six pack. I think you're in five of these, right? I, yeah. What I was in Kingdom as well. I was actually supposed to play the lead in Kingdom, and unfortunately, my my family had um, planned a family trip the week that they were shooting, and I had to turn the role down. And and it's actually something that I've regretted my entire life. I would have killed to play that role. So. You're you're in five out of the six of the six pack. I was like. Maybe they had a fight. Maybe he and Jr. were just like no. no. I just I just wasn't available, unfortunately. Still <laughs> kick myself in the ass over it, but uh, but yeah. So you had this run for. I mean, I, let me check my notes. I've got dates. I want to be very specific. I mean, it was the the run. I say Dead Next Door, Skinned Alive, uh, Maximum Impact, Humanoids from Atlantis, Chick Boxer, Galaxy of the Dinosaurs, Ozone. Then uh, there's sort of a after Ozone. There's like a two year. I don't know, like a break. Like, what? Uh, where'd you go? What happened? Um, honestly, it's one of those things where I don't quite. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, getting older sucks. But I don't quite remember that time period. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. That's I know the only finding yourself. What's up? That's when you were finding yourself. You were out. Right. right. Yeah. You're yeah. About. Yeah, I don't know what I I want to say because I thought that I was still pretty active with Tempe at the time. Mm -hmm. But you're right, it's a break in there. So I think the you know what it was they um the only thing to my knowledge that Jr. did during that time was Midnight to uh, Sex Death and Videotape. And again, that was a situation where they had come to me and asked me to play Abraham. And I chose not to because of the fact that I personally always had a problem with um, when there's a film, when you're doing a sequel and you recast one of the actors. And I, I, I mean, I grew up with the film Midnight, so I expected to see John Amplis playing the role. And I don't know what the factor was that why they couldn't get John Amplis, but I was like, no, in my opinion, the audience isn't going to buy me as Abraham, so I don't want to play the role. And then other rumors got, it's funny too, because other rumors got started about that where um, the rumor was I turned the room, the roll down because I didn't want to do the nude scene. So just to prove a point, I ended up doing a nude scene and bloodletting just to, just to mess with them. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
I want to let our uh, live viewers know that we're going to be cutting. We're going to cut into like a Q and A session here in a few minutes. So if you got questions for James L. Edwards, you need to just send them, submit them, and uh, we'll get right on those in just a few minutes here. But um, okay, so then after that, I, like I, there's a little bit of a break. Then polymorph bloodletting. By the way, someone should prepare these for Blu-ray. Uh, I don't know. I'm just floating that really? out here to the universe. I think it'd be pretty cool. The um, good news is, so uh, uh, I know, and I don't think I'm spoiling anything. I think I'm. Uh, I, I know he's in your ear right now. So have him scream stop if I, if I am. He is so <laughs> mad right now. <laughs> right now, I know Jr. is working feverishly on uh, special editions on Blu-ray of both Polymorph and Bloodletting. And I'm going to do my darndest to help him out in any way with special features and new stuff. And I can't wait, especially with the work that he's done on our previous efforts, uh, I can't wait to see how these movies are going to look. Because of my Tempe days, and I know JR doesn't want to hear this, but Bloodletting's always been my favorite. And of course I love Polymorph because I'm all over it and I wrote it. So it's like, so realistically, I can't wait to see what he does with this. I mean, the mm -hmm. level of, I'm going to, I'm going to brag on make flicks and what JR does with his stuff here is like the level of like extras. And uh, I mean, like kitchen sink level stuff. Like if there's anything that exists, it's going on the disc and then. Oh, absolutely. yeah. And that's the thing, honestly, uh, JR was really, a, well, not only do I owe JR, Pretty much, I, I mean, the, every movie I've every movie role I've ever gotten is in some way a result of Jr. Whether it was him giving me the uh, a shot when I was twelve, all the way up to people recognizing me in films and saying, "Oh, I love you in this. We want you in this." Every single role I've ever gotten is because of Jr. Bookwalter. That being said, Jr. is also responsible for. The, uh, a good amount of the, in fact, the majority of the post-production work on both Krista and um, uh, Brimstone in the sense that, I mean, like I said, the, I, we have an hour and a half worth of extras on Krista. Where do you think I learned to do that? You know, so it's like, that's all him. So. That's nice. That's, that's really cool to hear. Um, one more, I just want to kind of lead us up to the present day. So there's another little bit of a break. I mean, it's, it's not a little bit of a break. It was like seven or eight years after that. Like, was this, is this the family era when you're like settling down and you're kind of stepping away from uh, the screen? Um, stuff? Un unfortunately, that was a time period where um, I was working on my second marriage at that point. And looking back on that, it was one of those where it's tough because when somebody falls in love with you because they're attracted to artistic people, whether they be musicians or actors or filmmakers or whatever, and then they marry you and decide that, hey, you know, you're doing your movies is taking too much time away from the family. It, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So I'm kind of put in that position where it's like, okay, um, I'm being asked to not do movies anymore. And it was one of those where I basically chose to bow out in order to raise a family. And do I regret that decision? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm a family man now. It's like, I love my kids. I love my family. But if I could do it again, I would have tried to figure out a way to, to juggle both. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that, that's unfortunately just how that worked out. Well, you came back strong, which is where I wanted to lead it. Because it was after that, I mean, you come back, I mean, you're writing you're acting you're in you know you're you're doing things with other people you're in uh i mean look like mills versus zombies is kind of the it's like the it's like he's back and then here we are talking about director james l edwards do you have any advice or any i mean we kind of just covered a lot of time but do you have any advice for people who have seen these movies and they're like well i want to direct but they don't know where to start. I mean, first of all, I'll say listen to the commentaries because they're great. But you, if you're talking to them right now, what do you say to somebody who's like, I want to make movies? The, the biggest um, piece of advice I can give a budding filmmaker, and this is, this is held very, very true for my directorial efforts. Always surround yourself with people far more talented than yourself. Always. 
Um, because to be quite honest with you, I've always kind of felt like a fraud as a director. It's not. Uh, it's one of those where I uh, my passion is acting and writing. I never really wanted to be a director. The problem is I'm an egomaniac and a control freak, so therefore it was one of those where I'm always appreciative when someone wants to buy or make one of my screenplays. I'm very rarely satisfied when they do, simply because of the fact, with good reason, it's like they want to put their own personal stamp on it. Uh, otherwise, what's the point of them doing it? And I don't share well is the problem. Um, also, I, again, I, I've always been very fortunate to get offered a variety of roles. There are certain roles that I, I cherish very much and certain ones that I did because it's like, oh, well, this is available. I wanted to try and do that as less as humanly possible now. And again, that's why I started directing. Now, that being said, I also knew my limitations. I have no interest in picking up the camera. I have no interest in um, being an editor. I know a lot of filmmakers damn me for that because like, oh, you, you can't be a director if you, if you don't edit. That's fine. I don't really necessarily want to be known as a director. You know, um, I, um, I, I won't score my own films because I have no musical talent whatsoever. It's, it's always just one of those things where it's a struggle to find somebody that you can put your trust in. But once you do, it, and it's not, it's not impossible. It's difficult, but it's, it's, a, it's not impossible. Once you do and form that bond, it, it's just, it's amazing. So. Well, it's really uh, wonderful what you've achieved. And I think this is a good place to kind of open it up for our producer to field us some questions from our live studio audience. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully there's, okay, here we go. So Tim wants to know, he says, Brimstone is awesome, buy it. Well, that's another opportunity for me to hold this up and say uh, Brimstone Incorporated, now available. I believe there's a bundle deal for this right now. Uh, there is. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, if you buy, if you purchase both, you get $5 off your order. And it'll. if I'm not mistaken, also, it qualifies you for free shipping. So it's win-win. Plus, you get two incredible movies. So how can, how can you go wrong with that? You need right. them both. I mean, really, if anybody's on the fence about this and they're like, well, I just want the one. You need them both. It's not even mm. a discussion. Do them. Uh, Derek, uh, Derek Rogers asked, do you consider the movie similar to Creep Show or Twilight Zone anthology? Oh, they were, yeah, absolutely. They, um, Brimstone was a, uh, was, uh, hugely inspired by Creep Show, by Trick or Treat, uh, by Body Bags. It, it's one of those things where, again, my main thing was I was trying, trying to make something that was unique, but at the, also at the same token, kind of a throwback kind of thing. Because I love, I mean, anybody that sees my stuff, uh, my stuff knows that one of my running themes typically is I like uh, a kind of a 90s, 80s to 90s feel to my movies. And again, uh, the thing that I'm most proud about as far as Brimstone is the fact that it is completely different than Krista. And I think the performances are really fun. I think everybody did an amazing job. It's, um, like I said, it's a lot more accessible film for an audience than Krista was. Yeah. It's just, like I said, it was only meant to be just a good time where you can sit down, have a few scares, have a few laughs, and go from there. So, I'm again, I'm hoping that's what we were able to accomplish. I'm glad you brought up the scores, too, because the synthesizer, I mean, there's great synthesizer music in both of these films. Uh, different kinds, but... Um, I mean, they're not the same kind of score, but they're both good. Yeah, that, uh, that's all uh, my composer, um, uh, Matthew Sturgeon. He's phenomenal. He was one of those guys that um, I used to manage a CD and DVD store in Ohio that carried a lot of local artist music. And he was in a band at the time, uh, an electronica band called 20 Go to 10. And I always loved the band, but I wasn't I didn't know him. And when I was looking for someone to score the film, I had reached out, I tracked down, because they had been broken up for years at that point, but I had tracked down a few of the members of that band, and they just explained that, well, one person that would be very interested in it is our, um, our previous um, uh, keyboardist, because of the fact that, A, he's a huge horror fan anyway, B, he was the one that would be doing soundtrack work. So I reached out to him, and it was so funny because um, when I reached out to him, 
when I was work, everybody outside of the the quote unquote movie in, industry knows me as Lonnie Edwards. Um, so when I ran the CD store, I was Lonnie, and everybody in the movies knows me as James Edwards. Well, I contacted him, him up, and he remembered me as Lonnie Edwards, and we were talking for a little bit, and everything was great. And then shortly after that, I gave him my Facebook. Uh, uh, I sent him a Facebook request. And like I said, we were talking and I, I listened to his stuff and he did a demo and I loved it. And I reached out to him. I'm like, I'm, I'm making you the offer. I'd really like you to do the soundtrack. He's like, okay, yeah, I'd love to. He's like, just to verify, um, I have the job now, right? He's, I'm like, oh yeah. He's like, oh, thank God. Cause I want to tell you, I didn't realize that you were James L. Edwards. And I'm a huge Tempe fan. I, I'm so, uh, I, I'm so happy to be working with you, but I just want to tell you that cause I didn't want to look like a fanboy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh, that's great. Better. Always look like a fanboy. I eat that shit up. So. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I got a I got an anthology question for you, really quick. It's a real quick answer. Creep show one or creep show two? Oh, creep show one by by mile. <laughs> hey, the only the only thing reason that creep show two, in my opinion, holds up now or is even watchable is because creep show three happened. That's it. So I remember walking out of the theater. Uh, when Creepshow 2 came out, just being thoroughly disappointed. There are a lot of movies, in my opinion, that the, the reason we enjoy them now mm -hmm. is out of nostalgia. And I really feel Creepshow 2 is one of those. It just, like I said, I, I do like the, the Hitchhiker episode one. That was fun. So. Thanks for the ride. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, Jim asks, what made you choose to become a director? Um, honestly, it was just ego. I, I know that sounds awful. I know that sounds really bad, but um, I never had any burning desires to, uh, desires to direct. In fact, when we were in the early pre-production stages of Krista, I actually was interviewing directors because I had no intention of directing it. And the problem kept coming, like I said before, where they all wanted to put their personal stamp on it, which, again, looking back on it, I don't blame them one bit. But what I was looking for wasn't a director. I was looking for a yes man, where basically it's like, hey, I'm actually going to direct this, but I want you to put your name on it. And my producer, after I had spoke with like the, the fifth director that it didn't work out with, said, why don't you direct this? And I'm like, well, I'm not a director. And she's like, well, yeah, but you have a vision. You know what you want. So why don't you just make this your directorial debut? And I very... Um, uh, very uh, foolishly, I guess not foolishly, because I'm very happy with the results. But I, I, I just ignorantly thought, oh yeah, I can do that. But, but again, the the reason I was able to was because I had the opportunity for years, for decades, of doing movies with very, very talented directors and just learning from them. Yeah. Uh. Flow Tech Entertainment. So, James, what is your next project you have in the planning stages? At this point, uh, our hope. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you cut out there. I'm sorry. Um, at this point, our hope is that I have a revenge, uh, a revenge-based horror film that I've written called Trivial, that features, of course, my my normal group of actors, and the whole idea behind it is it's a group of people that have been kidnapped and chained up and are forced into a bizarre game show, that basically a trivia game show where if they get the answers right, they can advance, and if they get the answers wrong, they may or may not be killed. And our hope is if we can raise the budget, uh, we want to start shooting that by fall. I just sold that the Lions Gate. I'm sorry. It's it's been taken. It's been done already. <laughs> uh, Kip Myers, you ever think of doing a genre other than horror, directing or acting? Oh yeah, yeah. I actually, uh, what was it? I have a project um, that I've written. Well, I've, I've, I'm not gonna lie. I've done the treatment for. <laughs> I haven't done, but I um, I have the treatment for that. I I I uh, call it my uh, what was it? Uh, my um, my Coen Brothers movie, where essentially it's it's almost like a uh, a dark drama uh, crime thriller type, and th there's very little horror element to it. I again, I just love filmmaking. I, I'll always love the horror genre. I'm not I, I'm not saying that I want to use it as a stepping uh, a stepping stone, but uh, of course I'd like to expand out to uh, drama and possibly even comedy. But comedy's tough, so so we'll say. And then acting wise, what could I'm doing a Western as an actor, uh, was it a couple of months here on a film in Dayton, 
It's a Western comedy. And I'm doing a thriller in Akron. So yeah, I'm I'm trying not not, not I I'm again my low my true love will always be horror, but I'm trying to branch out a little bit. Very cool. Uh Jonathan A. Moody asks, tell us about co-writing as opposed to just writing your own project. That's always um uh what was it? That's always uh an interesting gig because I I almost exclusively write solo, but there have been points where I've I've co-written with somebody, and uh, and it's always uh, a matter of adapting to what they're most comfortable with. Because I, I I I sit there and act like I'm an egomaniac, but I'm also a people pleaser. So it's one of those where I want to make sure that they're most comfortable. So like in the case of uh, Matthew Jason Walsh, who directed Blood Cutting. And I had co-written a script uh, that unfortunately never got produced um, called um, Old Wives Tales that uh, JR and I had come up with a story for. <clears throat> and basically that entailed Matt Walsh and I sitting locked in a room for two weeks with a ton of cigarettes and coffee cranking out a script. Now, the flip side of that is uh, Jonathan Moody had co-written um, uh, Mama's Boy, one of the segments in Brimstone. And the way that came about was around 2016, he had contacted me wanting to co-write a project. And I said, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. I, 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 I enjoy his work. I, I'd like to get the opportunity to work with him. Well, I was expecting us to kind of work, so, work together. Well, it turns out like as soon as I agreed to the gig, 10 minutes later, he had sent me the first 10 pages of the script. He had already written it. And I'm like, and he's like, yeah, just finish it. I'm like, I've never done that before. And it, it was, again, it was a different situation, but it was actually a lot of fun. And I threw him a curveball that he wasn't expecting, but he liked it. And we kind of went from there. And it was so funny too, because unfortunately he, once we finished the script, he never got around to, to, to filming the movie. So when the idea of an anthology came up, I didn't have a lot of short film or a lot of short scripts. So I was going back in my mind, what do I do with that? So I remembered the Mama's Boy script and I contact Jonathan and I'm like, hey, are you planning on doing anything with this? And he's like, oh, probably not. I'm like, would you mind if I take a crack at it? He's like, oh, I'd be thrilled. That'd be great. He's like, one question. Can I still have a um, credit on the, uh, the as screenwriter? I'm like, of course you can. You co-wrote, half the, you co-wrote the script. So, so it was nice. Have you had an experience where you have not gelled with it? This is my question. Have you had an yeah. experience with a co-creator, a collaborator that you just didn't gel with? You don't have to get specific. Oh. I'm just curious. Oh, all the time. I mean, and that's the thing. It's like uh, there are plenty of people that have worked with me that I'm sure have looked back and say, this guy's an asshole, you know. But it's one of those things where it's like anything else. If you work, uh, Let's say you work in an office. You're not going to go along with everybody. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, especially in film, because it's a very creative venue, Everybody has their own idea of what's going to make uh, the, uh, the the right version of entertainment, mm -hmm. their version of entertainment. And egos will clash and feelings will be hurt. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, you kind of have to roll with the punches. I can tell you this. Typically, as an actor, is where I'll do most of my stomping. And I hate to say that, but I do. I, I was, especially in the 90s, I was not the easiest person to work with. Now, I've learned from that as I've gotten older, especially working with actors now. But I, it's, it's gone twofold. Now, as a director, on the other hand, I, I remember stories about George Romero, specifically, and how easygoing he was and how people would basically come, with it, come to him with ideas on set and whether he liked them or not, he still listened to them and in most cases actually filmed them. I try and kind of subscribe to that same theory because we're not making these movies for a lot of money. A lot of the crew specifically are volunteers. Uh, a lot of the cast are not being paid uh, a lot of money. And if they're being paid at all, everyone wants to be part of the creative process. It takes all of 10 or 15 minutes to not, to, I, I take seconds to hear somebody out and 10 to 15 minutes to shoot a small scene if they think that that's it. You, you might look at it in the editing room later and go, hey, actually, that's a really good idea. So, a perfect example of that is uh, Drew Fortier, um, who plays uh, uh, Gregory in um, uh, Brimstone and Nick in Krista, where it's like a lot of his dialogue is ad lib. 
a lot of his, uh, he'll throw his own little ad libs in. I think he's hysterical and a good amount of his stuff. He always hits the cues that I want as far as my script, but he'll also throw his own stuff in. And a lot of that stuff I've ended up using because mm-hmm. you don't have all the answers. It, it takes the entire team to kind of put that together. Yeah, I would think any filmmaker would, would want as many options as they could have for choosing. You know, oh, yeah. Movie when you're putting it together, but then we hear stories. I mean, there's directors I'm not going to name, but you hear the stories about, oh, they do one take. And if you ask a question, mm-hmm. they'll yell at you. It doesn't. Oh yeah. The collaborate film is a collaborative effort. So this is really interesting to get your perspective on that. Uh, do we have another question? Okay. Video Warlock a question for James. Would you ever be involved in a reboot of one of the films you've worked on? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, that I in fact I I'm kind of surprised. It's it's kind of it's funny because the only time that's ever been approached was um uh, what was it uh they uh I don't know if I'm allowed to say or not. I'm I'm assuming I can. Um Brad Twig had wanted to do a sequel slash reimagining of Zombie Cop. And he had contacted me to basically write a treatment for it. And I wrote a treatment, and unfortunately, it never came to be. But I thought that, I mean, there's nothing, uh, first of all, I, I've never understood why people don't take not so great movies that didn't have amazing budgets and remake them from there. A lot of these have a lot of really good ideas. Don't get me wrong, I'm not downing Zombie Cop, I know it has its fan base. But at the end of the day, it could have definitely benefited from a bigger budget, a um, uh, a more uh, a longer shoot time, that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, there are very few films from my past that I wouldn't want to go through and do a remake or a sequel or whatever. I just I I just love to act is what it comes down to. All right, sounds good. Let's see what uh, Derek Rogers asks: Would you make more anthology movies? Honestly, probably not. And the reason being is that I love horror anthologies. I'm a huge fan of that genre. And the problem that I have with horror anthologies is not on a personal basis. It's that they're really, really difficult to sell because, and I don't understand why that is. Because even like when, I mean, Creep Show ended up going on to be very successful. But I remember when it came out, it was not that big of a movie. Um, I, I, and, and it's a shame because, like I said, I, have, I think I, I couldn't be happier with the way Brimstone turned out. But it's, in some ways, it's been a difficult sell because a lot of people, for some reason, just don't get into anthology. Now, don't get me wrong. The fan base has, dev- I mean, we've gotten some fantastic reviews. Um, sales, have been, uh, sales have been really good. I just, I'm always, I'm my own worst critic as far as that goes. I always want a bigger audience. I always want more people to see my stuff. And I think most filmmakers are like that. But yeah, um, it'd have to be something really, really special to do as far as a an anthology. There is one. There is one that I'd really like to see get off the ground. And it's all going to be dependent on budget. Um, there, um, I was asked to, now I'm talking about directing. I, 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 I'm as an actor, if I believe in the script, I'm going to do anything, but as a director, I'm, I'm a lot less likely, but there is one, there's a film, um, that, uh, has been on and off now, uh, called seasons that I'm attached to as an actor that has, re- uh, has Reggie Bannister. Um, what was it? Uh, Lisa Wilcox, Lynn Lowry. Eric Freeman, and it also features the uh, um, the last screen performance of uh, Cleve Hall, who recently passed away. If they are able to raise the budget for that and are interested, I would ha- be happy to direct one of the segments on that. But if uh, if not, then yeah, it'd probably be a tougher sell to, as far as to get me to direct an anthology again. Just want to let everybody know we're in our final ten minutes. So if you've got a question for our guest. Shoot him in here before the clock runs out. Jim Villanueva asks, would you consider making a segment into a feature-length movie? Uh, one of the segments from uh, um, uh, from Brimstone or just in general? I'll, I'll answer both because I, uh, I know that's just a question that was sent. I love all of the segments in uh, Brimstone. I think they're fun. I think, it's a, I, I, think, I think all of them have the potential 
But to be perfectly honest with you, I think all three of them work better as shorts. I think if we expanded them out more. Now, that's not to say that I don't have uh, screenplays that, um, what was it, uh, that were that originated as shorts that would become. Um, it's funny because the reverse side of that is that I had a treatment that I wanted to do that uh, I was in talks with JR about for the possibility of a uh, sequel to Bloodletting. And he actually thought it would be better suited as a short. And the more I look at it, he's like, he's absolutely right. Which, again, he's a good voice of reason. Because if it were up to me, all my movies would be three hours long and be mostly dialogue. So it's like, so he's a very good voice of reason on that. Um. <laughs> all right. Uh, Derek asks, how did you meet J.R. Bookwalter and get into acting? JR, uh, what was it? My mom had seen an ad in our local newspaper looking for zombies for The Dead Next Door. And at the time, I had no interest in being an actor or a writer or anything. I wanted to be a special effects makeup artist. I was a Savini kid. I grew up with stream greats and Fangoria. And the problem with that was that I had no artistic ability whatsoever. So literally, I scored a quote-unquote audition with Tempe, again, at the time, Amsco Studios, which was basically him operating out of the basement of his grandmother's uh, house, uh, actually the garage of his house, of her house. And um, I show up with like four really crappy Polaroids, two of which I still have in a frame, actually, of me covered in fake blood. It was a mixture of re red food coloring and chocolate syrup and pumpkin guts and and I basically was promoting myself as a special effects artist. And they're asking me questions like, have you ever worked with foam latex? Which I hadn't. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 sure I have. So it didn't take them long after bringing me aboard of realizing this kid has no clue what he's doing. But they liked my spirit and kept me along as a production assistant. And then it kind of kind of gelled from there. And I was with the company until 2000. So, so that's how we met initially. And then during our downtime, I mean, uh, what was it? The thing that was cool about JR, and still is, is the fact that he's incredibly personable. I mean, even I've seen him talk for hours with fans that are just, just fans of Dead Next Door or Robot Ninja or, or uh, the, the Witch House series. I've seen him talk to complete strangers for hours, just bonding with the fact that they, uh, I, even people that don't like his films, he's able to sit down and have a conversation with. So that being said, it's one of those things where I I, I think that's where our friendship really started. That's great. Um, yeah, you and to think, you know, going back to when you first met him, here you are over three decades later, and we're talking about, you know, he's producing this this uh, this event, and it's just really cool how that relationship has stayed strong and. Um, I mean, that's that's really cool. Three decades in the business, still to have a good, healthy relationship with somebody like that. That's it's inspiring, really. And the thing is, um, we actually went through a phase where we weren't speaking for a good 15 years. We had had a falling out in the early 2000s. And it was basically uh, a, a lot of it was my fault because I was I'm very stubborn and pig headed. And, but um it was the way we actually got formed back together was when I was promoting the Indiegogo for Krista, he started posting it on his page. Uh, like we hadn't spoke, but he started posting it on the Tempe page. And I reached out to him. I'm like, listen, I really, truly appreciate this. I'm like, I know we've had our differences, but I want you to know that I, this really means a lot to me. He's like, listen, any problems that we had, he's like, we're both old men now. We got kids, we got families. He's like, any problems that we had seem petty and a bunch of bullshit now. I, I put all that behind me and I hope you have too. And I'm like, I, I have. And we ended up having lunch and we've uh, we kind of, we've, we've been inseparable ever since. That's, <laughs> that's great. That's that's fantastic. So, uh, I mean, we're winding it up here. We're, we're, we're wrapping it up. Uh, let's just remind people one more time that these are both available for sale right now you can only get brimstone through the make Quits website as of this uh this party this launch party there it is uh and uh while you're there do yourself a favor i understand that this that her name was krista is um like we talk about it and it's it's 
it's hard to talk about, but it's a really remarkable movie. And I want you to know, James, that I am just so impressed with it. And it is a rarity for, you know, not just independent horror, but just horror in general to have something that's so rooted in, I mean, I understand it came from a place of pain, but it's so rooted in a real human thing. That's what makes it work so effectively. So definitely want people to pick those both up and support them. Do you have any final thoughts or any oh, last words, the, oh. the last pitch for these movies? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any, do, can you, do you hear me? Oh, we have no audio. Can you hear me okay? Uh-oh. Guys, why, can you guys hear? Can you guys hear James? Because I can't hear James. Somebody comment to let me know if they can hear James. Producer, can you, can My you hear James? My final thoughts on this is essentially a thank you to the fans. You're back. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, there you're back. <laughs> I can hear you okay. Okay, carry on with your thought if you can hear me. Just go ahead with your final thought. Can you can you, can you not <laughs> hear me? Yeah. <laughs> well, We've got, we seem to have a delay, Anyone? but can yes, hear? I can hear you. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I can hear you, <laughs> but I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Maybe you can't see me either. Nope. We, it looks like, Give me, we, yes? yeah. Yeah. It looks like we lost, uh, we lost. Oh, no. Dead. Well, I'll bring us home then. Um, I think that both of these movies are hello absolutely oh, okay there we go wait sorry please. about that i don't <laughs> know what happened um as far okay. as uh final um <laughs> final thoughts like i was saying it's it, it's really a um it's really a matter of uh um, just thanking the fans. So the fans are are basically the reason that I've been able to continue going. And my casting group, I mean, they've just they've just been phenomenal. And and again, I, one thing, one thing that I. I do too want to sit. Okay. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. We're getting the music. Cool. We're getting played out um, so in this home. The, I, uh, um, that being said, it's like just check out Brimstone and contact me after. If you'll, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, guys, for, for James, for James L. Edwards, for Makeflix, uh, pick up the movies, and, uh, and, and you heard the man. So keep in touch and let him, know, uh, let him know what to think about him after you see him. Let's keep that conversation going. Thanks to everybody for being a part of this. Thanks for J.R. Bookwalter for producing this, putting it together. Thanks for uh, our, our guest, James L. Edwards, for sharing his experience. And thanks to you guys being here, asking your questions, and being a part of this. Hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. Take care. Bye now. Thank you.